with us. Miss there you guys. He is. Thanks Mahalo. for dropping by. Aloha no. Uh, those really dark crinoids again. Oh, I thought that was a tube anemone. Oh, maybe. Uh, drive by biology. Wait, what are, we, are we trying to look at something? No, no, no. We can keep moving. Thanks. Some questions coming in about 3D printing parts that will uh, be suitable for depth. I think I remember Robert, you telling us earlier, as long as you're printing at at density, not creating uh, yeah, you, you know hollow structures. Yeah, 100% oh, yep. fill, yeah. Uh, the PLA does just fine. Yep. Yep. Well, I think they, the parts are stronger, you know? The, yeah, I bet. Pressure. Makes sense. Oh, yeah, this is fantastic. We've got, it's like we've got some bamboos in another oh, one. Yeah, there's another one. Trident um, bamboos in the back, you know? Unbranched bamboo in the front with some chrysogorges. Um, we've seen several metallic gorges that have been very pale, very easy to miss as well. Um, mm -hmm. Just now, it's so interesting to see how these communities have changed as we've moved up with depth. Um, I think when we started today or yesterday, we had a lot of um, Walteria sponges. I think a I lot think of chrysogorges too. But we had a, a different antha, anthamastus that was uh, dominant, that brighter red color, as opposed to the, the paler color that we see with like that one. And that one looks like a true anthamastus I remember this time. going through a space where the anthamastus was dominant, but I do... Or not, not dominant, yeah. but uh, no, what I meant was uh, the, the brighter red color was the, the uh, dominant oh, type, more of dominant the type we were one. seeing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Definitely not the dominant species. Yeah. Great. Yeah. No, it's so, but it's so interesting, you know, because we've seen chrysogorges, we've seen, you know, some of these sponges, but they've changed, right? We also went through an area of, mm -hmm. you know, high density, of, or, well, there were a lot of, um, you know, polyapagons, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, so scary. sponges, and, you know, we've been here for almost an hour, and I don't think we've seen any of those, and there's so many no, reasons why haven't. that can be. Oh, well, we're 400 so meters, almost 400 meters higher, too. Exactly. You know, there's so many reasons, depth sedimentation, the type of rock. Uh, it's, um, it's so interesting to see some of these changes. Oxygen saturation is, uh, ah, sorry, it's updating slowly. It's a little higher. It was down a bit, and it's been coming back up in mm -hmm. uh, the last 10 minutes. Yeah, you know, so. that's another important characteristic to keep track of is very definitely is what the oxygen is. Um, yeah, I think areas. we found that was a pretty significant factor in the Lilio colonies last year. Yeah. Um, yeah, in about the last two hours, it, it's dropped uh, quite a bit. So I'm just looking at some little more localized trends in the short term data. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, three hours ago was at 20%. At the moment, it's uh, between 15 and 16% saturation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that could definitely have some sort of an effect on uh, what we're seeing. Right. Mm -hmm. So any number of things could be um, there. They found that there's usually a combination of factors that is impacting the the horizontal as well as the depth, the vertical gradients and communities that we see. And it's so, always so interesting to see those changes. Have you noticed some changes in the, um, you know, the rock structures? The, the um, they, they look pretty similar to some of the places we were seeing yesterday with the uh, alternating um, uh, piles of, uh, you know, pillow to kind of lobate looking lavas. Uh, and then uh, these lower areas of uh, sediment and uh, debris in between. So we were seeing a lot of that uh, on our last watch. And that's where I was speculating it. Yeah, maybe there's there's something going on with a topographic inversion, maybe not, but yeah, I, I have to do a little more digging still in order to uh, 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 figure out how the dynamics of uh, these kinds of landscape 
uh, modifications uh, work in the deep sea versus uh, versus on the surface. I, I think there's an analog here, but um, you know I don't know for sure. And uh, this this is something I learn as I go too. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've walked across many a, many an inverted terrain in the, when I've been doing field geology in the southwest. So, can yeah. you explain to some some folks at home what? Oh, field? that's a sea star. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Just a sec here. Oh my gosh! I thought that was a sea cucumber. No, that's one of those sea stars with the. Yeah kind of an amorphous blob with just five points at the top. And then is that a, like a type of slime star, this one, or is you it know, something different? You know, I'm not different? sure what the common name slime star actually is. Oh, Scott says it's a slime star. Oh, great. Nice. Okay. <laughs> then yes. Yeah. It, it, they, they, uh, for me, the slime stars kind of have this sort of, like, I don't know, like, sort of blobby appearance. It's really hard to describe. Yeah. Uh, really hard to articulate. I like your description of an amorphous blob. Amorphous yeah. blob yeah. with five little points. And one Some unit amorphous, large. maybe. <laughs> one <laughs> unit large, yes. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> and Steve says that it has pink clouds of slime. Ah, I want to see that. Yeah, yeah. That sounds so fantastic. And uh, yeah, we also want to note, thank you, Scott, for this, that uh, the slime star is more descriptive name, so it's like a common name. It's, it's not the formal name. Correct. So um, volcanic inverted topography is a, is a fairly common feature that you get in areas that have been subjected to lava flows, but where you also have a lot of sediments. Ooh, do we want to pull a Niskin here? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh. maybe. Yeah, actually, oh, we, do we, we have more of those um, Tina fours? I think we do. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah we just got Tina back, hydride. so we can hold here. Oh, okay. Awesome. Yeah, could, could we do a Niskin? Yeah. Can we get a, first, can we get a zoom yeah. on some of those Tina fours? <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Is it the Coromorphs? Coromorphs? Oh, interesting. Yeah. That's a, see the their tentacles the hanging out at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. off to uh, the yeah. left there. I'm not sure Beautiful. about... Uh, yeah, the, the Tina fours there are pretty astounding. Um, Is that them hanging out on the ends of the spicules there? Some of them, Those yeah. pink ends? Yeah, I think so. I think they are, yeah. Or is it, is it this one? Sorry, we got to yanked around, so. Do you want me to, okay. I can try and pull okay. us back a little bit so we can get this yeah. skin real quick. Yeah. Uh, mm, yeah, and then uh, I think uh, that might. Quick, it'll be yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Tina 4. <coughs> I think we're going upslope. I keep on getting shallower and shallower. Yeah. We're not kicking up dust yet, so. All right, so while we're getting into position here to take a Niskin, just before we go off bottom, uh, yeah, a uh, quick definition of volcanic inverted topography. This is what you get in an area that does have a stack of sediments, and then you erupt a lava flow over top of them. That's that's the normal sort of geologic sequence that we see is, um, you know, uh, uh, all other factors aside, uh, your younger uh, geologic layers will be stacked right. uh, on top that's of good. each other. And uh, you get a lava flow on top. Um, yeah, anything good. not covered by that lava flow will okay. eventually erode yeah, away. Objects appear closer than the actual. Yeah, no, I was like, because it, it, it did. <laughs> Ten dip. meters is still like a three-story uh, building. No, so. but it dipped to like four and three, <laughs> and I was like, mm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's it's okay right now, but like I said, I saw it dip for like for a second to three or four, and I was like, no, let me. It's your chance to stick the landing, Zach. See what you got. <laughs> Yeah. Some deep sea gymnastics with robots. Yeah, that was unfortunate timing for the <laughs> jet pump to go out. <laughs> Right at the end. It knows. <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, yeah. Volcanic conversion. Uh, basically, more resistant capping material. You erode away the stuff that doesn't have that lava over top it. You end up with older layers higher up than some of your younger layers because things start redepositing in those valleys that form. So, it's it's something I've been wondering about seeing in this area. So, I, yeah. And I just haven't been uh, near my laptop in a couple of days because I've been trying to keep myself awake and functional. So, it's a little research that I got to do this afternoon. So. Or maybe right now, because I can. You can. Yep. We have a really interesting question. I'd be curious to know more about those who, who know about the, the BPA leaching, that some of our plastics and microplastics are um, potentially leaching out some, some of these chemicals uh, as they degrade in, in salt water and sunlight. I'm curious, there are folks who are wondering if there's concerns about bringing 3D printed products down into the deep sea, which they don't end up staying down here, not so for very long. So PLA is a, is a very good plastic, you know, as far as that goes. Not breaking down very very quickly or very well, very much? You know, I think it's, it's said to be not... Uh, uh, the, the great water. Yep. We haven't found any issues with it. Uh, you know, the vehicles are down. They're not in the water all the time. They're yep. mostly on deck, really. You know, if you look at over time. Yeah. So, I don't think you'd want to make plumbing out of it, but. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I've done some uh, leaching experiments with uh, 3D printed PLA. Uh, uh, lab equipment like stands and stuff because I've been making some of those for my lab here and there and uh, uh, PLA does eventually give off uh, particles if you leave it long enough. I, I don't know about long-term leaching in uh, straight water but uh, yeah. in, in weak acids it, it does kind of start doing that so you definitely long-term don't want that in your water uh, you know lining your water supply or anything uh, especially if there's any pH control issues with your water treatment. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Val. I would I would like to try doing some 3D printing with uh, polypropylene. So we can oh get yeah. Some, some floats, you know. That would be interesting. We have a lot of need for floaty things to do the science here. Yeah. But it's very hard to print polypropylene, apparently. So like temperature That's, control issues or something. It doesn't want to stick to the oh. stick to the plate. Yeah, one way I've modded my 3D printer is using a tempered glass plate and uh, coating it with a, a thin film of uh, just off-the-shelf glue stick. Yeah. Sometimes it makes things stick that's, a little too well. That's old school. <laughs> I, well, I was having a lot of problems with the uh, synthetic mat because I was uh, yeah. the PLA was just warping off so easily, and that's that's one of the problems with that model is it it has an uneven uh, heating bed. Uh. No such thing as old school to a geologist. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. Well, there is a little bit of old school. There's a little bit of new school. A lot of that has to do with, like, clean room, you know, uh, technical true. aspects of clean rooms, but I'm not going to bore you guys with that. <laughs> it sounds like that's uh, on the slate for uh, my research group meeting uh, on this on this Friday again, yeah, so i got to go It's going to take a while it. to make this happen. Okay. Uh, I got him to inch this way a little bit more. We'll see. Yeah, we need we need feet, not inches. Well, I was <laughs> speaking figuratively. <laughs> I can't hear you. Um, but I think we're at our off bottom time, aren't we? Yeah. Is this right here? Is that? The I community? mean, we can just take one. Yeah, if let's you let's just, just take one. Let's just take one. We're we're pretty close. And then and here. then yeah, we you gotta drive. go. I'll take. Padawan. <laughs> Gotta organize ourselves over here. So, yes. I think we need to get over there. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so, um, camera back. Yeah, we're, we're coming up against our off-bottom time, so this is just going to be a uh, niskin and go. So we get to end it on uh, 
really nice little uh, uh, diverse mm -hmm. little ecosystem here, a little community. Which one are we doing? Um, number two, if can. Uh, let me see if I can roll back a little bit more. There we go. Can you get over there more? Is it a camera? No, that's Ooh, it. That's, that's it. it? That's it. And you can't go back? Oh, there it goes. I should have zoomed in a little bit. Did it go? Yeah, I think yeah. It, I saw it go, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Wonderful. Mahalo, pilot. Thank you. I yeah, will say, technically, we were off bottom before 9 a.m., so. <laughs> 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 technically. All right. Thank you so much, front row. Uh -huh. uh, which sample number was this? Um, that was sample 102. 102. Thank you. Hey, we reached the triple digits. Yeah. You know, you're not a real scientist unless you go overtime. <laughs> That's right. True. <laughs> yeah, guilty as charged. <laughs> not the first time. Probably won't be the last. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, I've actually been late to uh, a couple of lab meetings just because I was, like, neck deep in samples and just lost track of time. <laughs> yeah. This is why I wear a, wear a watch on both wrists, because if I'm in the lab and I'm doing something with whatever hand, sometimes, you know, you got to keep track of that, that time very closely so you make your next meeting. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I put alarms on my phone for that reason. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, ready to come up? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's about time. I live and die by the digital to. calendar. Okay. Go this way. Like, I, yeah, I, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll have meeting reminders sent to my smartwatch. Smart? The right orientation yeah. there. I just avoid meetings. See, <laughs> you're doing it right. <laughs> I, I agree. I think I'm in that category. <laughs> I don't have to. No, you're doing something right. <laughs> I have to run an errand. Do you guys need anything from the store? Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Come on. I'll conveniently come back at lunchtime. No, there you go. <laughs> I have food, okay. everyone. You know, I don't mind the meetings. Unless they could have been an email. Yes. Which are 99% of meetings. Uh huh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not in the lab. Yeah, but it, it depends. Usually our lab meetings are really enjoyable. I, I really love going to those because we'll, we'll come in, we'll talk about papers, you know, update each other on our research. Uh, uh, you know, talk, talk about if there's any issues in the lab that need to get sussed out or, you know, yeah. triage, you know, instrument or uh, lab space time. And that's that's all really valuable. But uh, sometimes when it's it's a meeting where it's just like, uh, you know, can you can you uh, give me your budget number for this proposal or uh, uh, whatever? Yeah, that could totally be an email. Absolutely. I mean, just yeah, we just have to think about meetings a little differently. The eight to twelve watch, the greatest watch on earth. I like this meeting. It's a meeting. Yeah. yeah. Four hour meeting. When else would we tolerate a four hour meeting? Ooh. Never. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. Retreats. <laughs> Oh, retreats. Yeah, yeah that's just There's another that's just here, another yeah. name for too many meetings. Retreats. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of here. Peace. Just kidding. I love working together with all of my colleagues. Mm -hmm. I'd sit down in meetings with them. But it's always, you know, a nice thing about living and working in Hawaii, especially with the great all people right, I get so to work to with. Is we can have our meetings the at the direction. beach. We can have our meetings at the local IA. Yeah. We can have our meetings on the trail. Yeah, very true. I actually just missed a staff retreat yeah, yesterday, today, two-day retreat, but they're at Kakoibi in oh, Kahalu'u, and it. they are the out getting dirty in the lo'i in a taro patch yes. for some fun team bonding, cleaning if kalo. If you're waist deep in mud, it's a way. great meeting. Yeah, it's a for great sure. Great. But I must say that not all of it, this is very few way. and far in between for our meetings, most the of them take place in our office and uh, yeah. they can be emails sometimes. <laughs> Sorry, Kalana. <laughs> we do love our colleagues and we're all doing the best we can. Mm -hmm. Ew. Well, I don't know how we got trapped in this uh, world of meetings, but mm -hmm. uh, 
we'll find our way out of it eventually. Yeah. Yes. Look at how dense the Chrysogorgias are here. You know, I saw a news article this morning from a couple of days ago that um, somebody on, I think, Big Island uh, pulled up, uh, farmed a record large uh, taro root. Ooh, wow. The world's biggest taro. It was 49.97 pounds. Oh my what? gosh. That's a lot of poi. Let's that go. is a lot of poi. Yeah. Let's wow. go. That's going to feed the whole village. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing. There's a whole science also dating back, just like with navigation, just mm -hmm. like with fishing, of dating back uh, to uh, cultivating kalo. Kalo is a plant extremely significant in Hawaiian culture and uh, represents uh, a relative. Mm -hmm. Represents uh, family, yeah. uh, family that feeds us, and uh, uh, it's a bit of a sad story, but it's a it's an important one in in the collection of Hawaiian mo'olelo that uh, Halo is um, very very important figure, and and the Kalo have uh, been studied by indigenous scientists, Kanaka scientists for over a thousand years as they learned how to cultivate them, generated yeah. incredible Aoi systems and mm -hmm. Lo'i lo Kalo terraced uh, wetland farming systems that uh, brought nutrients from the highlands all the way out to the ocean, but with stopping all along the way to, to nourish the community, just brilliant, yeah. Incredible. Yeah, uh, what they're saying about this, uh, about this record taro is that uh, uh, the guy who, who farmed it, uh, it was over in Captain Cook. Um, he uh, did this without using any fertilizers, and uh, he uh, credits uh, indigenous sustainable farming methods. That's wow. it. Yeah. That's it. Those big island farmers. Look at that kalo. Oh, my wow. gosh. Dr. That's Val just showed it. It looks like, uh, oh, my gosh. That thing is enormous. It is. Amazing. I wonder how many years that was growing. I don't know. Let's go. That's I'm hungry awesome. again. I know. Is it a giant taro? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow. Oh my gosh. Nice work, wow. Uncle. That's insane. Yeah. All the hands. A lot of times our, our lo'i, we're talking about kako ivi, mm -hmm. you know, our lo'i are places for communities to gather. Many hands get put to work, uh, you know, weeding, you know, digging out, planting, cultivating, uh, not just human hands, but uh, visited by many are native Hawaiian wetland birds and uh, all kinds of other creatures. Of course, plenty of microorganisms, a lot of our native fish, some of them endemic to Hawaii, um, many of them endemic to Hawaii, yeah. find their way into the Lo'i patch. So it's uh, yeah, just a really spectacular, e true ecosystem where mm -hmm. humans are included, yeah. an important part. Mm -hmm. So, so important. Just working in unison um, really? to really feed one another. And I mean, not only at our level as humans, but um, the whole ecosystem is feeding and living off of itself, helping one another survive and thrive. Yeah. There's a, a, a beautiful, beautiful article written by some teachers, uh, Kavika Winter and, and Sam Gon, talking about how uh, this Hawaiian agricultural system, agroecology, mm -hmm. really could uh, help pull the world out of our current climate and biodiversity crisis mm -hmm. really does show how mutualism, we were talking about that yeah. earlier before, mutualism, cooperation, taking all species. A, I was really fascinated for a while by human-centered design that became sort of a, a hot concept and topic in the innovation and engineering world. And um, I really feel like it, not quite enough. We have to think mm -hmm. about every living thing and just be a part of that whole ecology surrounding us that we are uh, in fact a part of so if we act like we're not that's where things start to break down so mm -hmm. same is true in the deep sea we cannot pretend that we are not part of this very important ecosystem and uh, have to act accordingly exactly yeah. yeah if i remember correctly uh manoa has a taro patch that uh yeah. many of the Kaneboy, students yeah. Uh, yeah, contribute Kaneboy, to yeah. it's beautiful yeah. to kind of uh, uh, help foster that sense of uh, mm -hmm. uh, mutualism and uh, community uh, community effort such an incredible important space of learning our fish ponds our um, our lo'i our taro patches um, mm -hmm. you know all the way up our entire watersheds you know really our school our kula in hawaii um, shouldn't be a building mm -hmm. uh, it should be uh, it should be the incredible 
environment that surrounds us might be true everywhere. We yeah. should uh, tune our attention to, uh, to the environments that we are a part of, that we occupy. And it's amazing, such incredible classrooms, just like the deep sea, just like the ocean, mm -hmm. like, like the canoe. All of these spaces are spaces of learning. Yeah, it's really definitely. Yeah, Kanewa, I remember going there when I was in elementary with my classes. And they, that, you know, Lo'i, that area, it also provides um, college students the opportunity for uh, to work there. And then they also bring in different school groups. Um, but the hale that's there, and, you know, I had a dear friend, and our, a mutual friend, Tiana Henderson, who was a master hale builder. Um, and so this is building, you know, without any nails or screws, just lashing with kaula rope. Um, and so she actually, we built a smaller hale uh, up in Palehua, where I used to live in Makakilo on the west side of Oahu. And she helped to build um, a hale at West Oahu, uh, the University of Hawaii at West Oahu. And, you know, there, Kanewai has a hale, but I remember just stepping into these spaces at different moments of my life and it just being a great um, place of learning. Uh, I remember the lessons being taught there, various stages. And I also remember going to Koholawe, uh, Hakioava, on the, um, the other side of Koholawe that's facing Maui. Mm. But they have a hale there too. And so just like all of these spaces that we see as classrooms. Um, and then I just distinctly remember different parts of my life, different seasons, different ages, being able to be welcomed into that space by the kumu, the teachers there, and how profound it was for me. Wow. And the environment so transformed when it's a space that was uh, so obviously built by human hands and with mm -hmm. human intention. I, could, I can just picture uh, the young ones climbing up in the hale, helping mm -hmm. to lash the hale, and just making it be a part of the, the actual construction, um, yeah. being a part of the learning itself. And, uh, and it, it carried on even after the hale was finished, completed, uh, mm -hmm. that learning, that, that sense of that we're cultivating something in this space together is, uh, is really important. And I think sometimes lost in, in uh, what's become sort of traditional schooling. And I know in Hawaii, we're working really hard. I know. Uh, Mahina and I work with Kupu and my work with Purple Maita and so many folks in Hawaii doing amazing work to um, to remind ourselves and our community that uh, we have the greatest the greatest classrooms in, on earth all around mm -hmm. us all the time so yeah I've definitely heard Nainoa Thompson say that our greatest classrooms too are the oceans around our islands the channels that surround the Paiaina our Hawaiian islands and our archipelago um, you know, just the way that our islands have been formed and how wind funnels through each channel very differently and how every channel has its own characteristics and personality, um, different, you know, swells and winds and rains. So I think it's like all around us. We are very connected to the, the learning spaces that are our aina, our moana, our kai, our ocean, our land, our sea. These are classrooms that our ancestors have studied for years, generations. And I think it's, you know, only we're slowly moving the needle and kind of coming back to that that classroom, that yeah. indigenous classroom, that space. Yeah, it's uh, it's seeping into the control van, turning the control van into mm -hmm. a hale. Yeah. Um, not only on this expedition, but across many, thanks mm -hmm. to Kate thanks to the commitment of Ocean Exploration Trust. And I've been thinking actually a lot about Nainoa and some of his, uh, his words about understanding the language of the earth and really mm -hmm. being able to speak to, speak to this beautiful planet ocean and uh, understand what she's telling us. Mm -hmm. and, um, and as I listen to, to Val talk about uncovering these mysteries of how the earth has been shaped and created yeah. over millions of years and listen to Virginia and Kukui share their their Ike and Manao about uh, all these living things and how they've mm -hmm. adapted and sort of taken root and build these communities in these incredible places. It's uh, it's really that. It's really the uh, effort to understand the language of the earth, understand uh, planet ocean and, and uh, how mm -hmm. we fit in, how we be a part of that. And also hearing the stories from Catalina, from Aquaman himself, from, mm -hmm. uh, from mm -hmm. Zach and 
and Amber, just remarkable that we're able to construct this Halle together, yeah. metaphorical Halle here in the control van, and appreciate you all so much for that. It's, mm -hmm. It means more than I'll ever be able to tell you. So. Most definitely. Mahalo for your mo'olalo, everyone, your stories mm -hmm. that you bring and share with us. Eyo. And we're on our way, just like that. A we few thoughts, there. and we slip up a few hundred meters, and uh, we're now just under a mile from the surface on our way back home. Mm. Every dive, in some ways, feels a bit like a dream that we uh, re-emerge from as we invite the ROVs back on deck during recovery. And we're talking a little bit about that, uh, a little bit about that this morning at breakfast, some of the wild sleep dreams that we have while we're at sea. And it's a familiar story for those who spend time at sea and curious about the neuroscience behind that and what's, what's going on in our brains and, and our bodies to that facilitates that, but also what's going on in this ecosystem around us that's also facilitating that. And yeah, I don't know if uh, anyone anyone wants to uh, delve into some of the wacky dreams that they've been having, but uh, I welcome it. Love hearing about people's uh, they're, they're kind of personal, you know, intimate things, the things that go on in our heads during our during our sleep. Sometimes hard to remember, but uh, yeah, might have been pretty wild, but they just keep slipping away on me. So unfortunately, yeah. I don't remember them. I think it's probably a good thing most of the time. It's yeah, I think a lot thing. of it's like dive or rock related or, yeah. yeah. Oh, no. Same. <laughs> yeah. Too many rocks in your head? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it was a mix of things actually. We, I think we just, it was a dream where we just saw a pumice rock, but then we needed somebody to go down in Hercules. Like Hercules was a submarine uh -huh. somehow. <laughs> and we needed somebody to go down and get it. And then I think a couple of us went down in Hercules to go get it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Let's go, Kukui. Oh, oh beautiful. Jelly. 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 Always fun on, on the descent and ascent, seeing uh, what surprises we get showing up in the water column. Yeah. Amid water. One of, one of the lesser studied portions of the ocean, the things in between the surface and, yes. the, uh, and, the, and the sea floor. Yes, I have at least one friend who is uh, studying some of the parasites that you find on within and among jellies and different gelatinous organisms within the, you know, this uh, pelagic area in the midnight twilight zone. Yeah, and, it's awesome. Twilight. You know, it's always so interesting to just see the organisms that she's working on. Um, they're just... I mean, they're what you think of when you think of the deep sea, right? They're clear, or they have massive eyes, or they're yeah. just, you know, they're spooky. Yeah. That's that, little, that little zooplankton baby crab that we pulled up. Oh, oh um, off a of herc the other oh, day? Yeah. 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 Dan's oh, new cool. friend. <laughs> <laughs> he, something, he didn't seem too fond of it. <laughs> Love it. Have to, uh, have it was to so read. tiny. It was tiny. Have to read this comment. Val, you rock both literally and figuratively. Please, when you're on watch, don't ever stop talking about what you are seeing. You have a unique way of making geology fun and interesting <laughs> from the great state of Vermont. Oh, and uh, I know we all echo yes, that sentiment, Val. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's such a privilege to have you as our watch lead. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. So, Zach and Robert, uh, do you want the witch cam up in that center? Winch cam, winch cam. No, no. Do you guys need it to watch? No. You can see it. Oh, oh. I didn't poke my head around. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> that same commenter, Val, um, curious about how we get some of the, the, I think right before our watch, um, or maybe during our last watch, I'm not sure exactly what they're referring to, but there were very rectangular rocks um, that were seen, and they were curious as to how those, 
how those kinds of rocks form, those what they consider to be seem like unusual shapes in nature. We don't definitely in biology we don't often see that, but it might be referring to some kind of columnar basalt. I'm not Could exactly be. sure. Um, I'll have to go back and look at uh, uh, some of the stills um, in order to be sure. Um, because I was definitely asleep and probably having some <laughs> really wild dream <laughs> when that was happening. That might have had um, something to do with columnar basalt, but who uh, knows? Oh, who knows? <laughs> I, I'm, I, I, there's always that possibility. But um, yeah, actually, uh, my mom helped me out uh, a little bit with that because I woke up to some uh, WhatsApp messages from her, if my phone screen will behave. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, she sent me a couple of stills of an intrusive dike at about... 3.08 this morning. I was wow. very much asleep. Yeah, um, so yeah, it looks like uh, there was an intrusion and uh, uh, maybe they sampled it. But yeah, um, if that's what we're talking about here. Um, Let's talk about it. That yeah, sounds we, interesting. Uh, it looks like, it's look, looks like enough of the, uh, uh, the host rock, uh, part of the intrusive sequence that built up the volcano over time. Uh, uh, it might have uh, fallen away and it uh, sort of cross-sectioned into uh, some sort of a feeder dike, basically um, a dike that uh, acts as part of the magmatic plumbing system out to these ridges that, uh, uh, that we're exploring. So, um, yeah, you see those? You know you're seeing into uh, volcanoes' guts, which is always cool as far as I'm concerned. One of Val's favorite Can't places to be in the volcano guts. In the guts of the <laughs> volcano. <laughs> I love that so much. Tell me yeah. from where you come. <laughs> <laughs> Give me all your secrets. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. that's fantastic. Well, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, those those are uh, they they are a little bit different from the normal like uh, pillow basalts, uh, the lobate and the sheet flows that we see. Um, you know, the rubble and the sediments. Uh, yeah, they're actually part of the internals, so uh, it's a good spot. Volcanic plumbing is always beautiful, fascinating to see. Uh, we've had a couple dives where we, you know, seem to be cruising along dikes and intrusion of, <laughs> you know, these formations quite a lot. Um, some yeah. other seamounts may a harder time finding some of those, uh, uh, some of those spaces. Um, yeah, and it kind of depends on the on the dive track that we that we opt for too when we go and plan these out. So okay, sometimes good. if you go up uh, what looks like a collapsed canyon wall, you can confirm that because you're you're just seeing everything in cross section. Yeah. Um, other times we, uh, 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 actually quite frequently, we uh, uh, go and explore up uh, along uh, ridge crests where uh, you're, you're, not, you're not necessarily as likely to see that, that kind of uh, structure. Sometimes you will if uh, it's still part of uh, something that uh, 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 collapsed off the flanks of a volcano, but uh, if it hasn't been and it's actually still part of the original uh, volcanic rift uh, topography, well, bathymetry, um, you, you may see uh, instead some of the last lavas that float over top of that uh, uh, ridge before uh, the volcano went extinct. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So that it, it kind of depends on what we're interested in seeing, interested in exploring, you know, kinds of communities we're interested in documenting. Uh, and, you know, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes we want to shake it up a little bit and see different portions of the volcano and different Absolutely. kinds of communities too, you know. Got, like in a canyon, uh, you know, we can, we can ask questions about uh, what kinds of uh, communities are we going to see in more heavily sedimented areas or in areas that are steeper, you know, um, what's, what's going on at uh, greater depths, both geologically and biology, and, uh, you know, what, uh, what's going on in the water column to support that. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. It, it has, at first, I think I was, I was hoping all of our dives were going to be just like that first one, that hemichorellium forest we went through, and then I wanted them to be just like the one we did I think on Seamount 11, um, that was just an incredible corals and sponges and rock formations. Mm -hmm. But as now that we've gone through just nine or ten of these seamount dives, uh, I think, yeah, maybe or maybe seven or eight of these seamount dives really appreciate the diversity. And I know part of that's the dive planning, like you were just talking about. We want to find sort of different faces, different characteristics of these uh, seamounts, so that we get a, a little bit more of a, a variety of a picture. Um, we're only going down on each seamount one time, um, so it's you know trying to be thoughtful and intentional about those dive plans and what we're going to see. And and it's actually great that every every dive has felt pretty unique to me. And, yeah. Uh, I think uh, now looking back on it, I I really appreciate that. If you had just asked me, I would have just picked the roller coaster ride every time. And just <laughs> said, give me, yeah. give me the 
the good stuff, but it's all good stuff. And it's yeah, every it's dive really I've amazing. had out here has been totally unique. Yeah. And yeah, I've been on uh, three dives on King George Seamount, and all of those were spectacularly different. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah on the same seamount, but uh, yeah, can be very different from ridge to ridge, from face to face. Uh, it's outstanding. It really means that you know, one, you know, characterizing one little portion of a seamount isn't necessarily representative, uh, particularly right. biologically. And that's that's the problem that we have in geology is a lot of our uh, seafloor, um, you know, our isotopic understanding of the seafloor is um, often based on one or two samples from yeah. uh, seamounts. And, you know, that, that probably, in geology, that probably actually works okay for the most part. Uh -huh. But it's, it's still only just part of the total compositional variation that uh, we, we might expect to see in that seamount. Yeah, it, it gives right. us a good general, like, like flavor and, and you know, kind of confirms, yeah, this, this is uh, doing what we think it's doing, the greater trend. But, you know, it, it doesn't characterize the, you know, like the early or, well, probably won't get to the early stages of the seamount. Those are very hard to sample on these uh, well-developed ones. Uh, but, you know, we don't necessarily know what it's doing as it phases into its later stages or, uh, you know, what, what some of its true outliers might look like. Yeah. Right. Much like what you see throughout several places on even uh, Oahu, where, uh, yeah, we see some very, uh, you know, it has an overall um, flavor to its mantle type. And that's that's pretty consistent, but there are some very specific portions of Oahu uh, uh, that uh, have a much more uh, extreme version of that composition, and it occurs in kind of one rather small uh, restricted space. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and it's always interesting, you know, the the biology, the the changes, the gradients of change are so much smaller there's so much such a small scale for some of these gradients of change and um uh you know the other thing is there's so many different um components that are changing as well you know we've mentioned on this dive alone we've mentioned oxygen and substrate type and height from the seafloor and currents well there's also you know on on small the very smallest scale you know you, you look at the grain size between you know the the, the space between particles of sand mm. you know that can be really important for organisms so you know um there is there's no way to capture that sort of level of fine scale information on just a single you know dive unfortunately but what you can do is you can look at sort of the environmental parameters that we have available to to collect um whether that be from the, the rov itself or from like you know um uh, satellite imagery, getting information about chlorophyll, and you can use that um, on to map large scale changes um, across the seamount and see if you see similar locations elsewhere. Yeah, certainly. Um, and so then you can target those locations for second dives or, yeah. you know, just be like, hey, you know, we saw a lot of diversity in a similar, you know, area that could be, this could be an area that needs protecting as well. So mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, it's, uh, well, it's understandable. It's so difficult to get out here, and it's so great to get these, you know, snapshots. What we're seeing really and truly is a snapshot. snapshot really, yeah. yeah. It goes back to what uh, I think the distinction, important distinction Robert made between this vessel and, and most other ocean-going vessels. We are EV Nautilus. We are exploration right. vessel Nautilus. Uh, most ships coming out here are RV with various exactly. names, but research vessels. And so what they might be coming out very clear and specific targets of what they want to sample. They often will follow up on missions that the Nautilus has done uh, to map certain areas or character, get a general characteriz characterization uh, similar to, to what Virginia was just describing um, and maybe have a little bit more of a sort of targeted mission. We really want to do sediment cores and try to yeah. try to take a bunch of different samples. But exploration is far from kind of the random sampling scientific method, you know, attempts at understanding uh, ecosystems where you can collect tons and tons and tons of targeted data. Mm -hmm. We're really just going out there and taking everything in. And then that has to go out and be sorted by different labs and different research uh, communities. 
uh, around the world. So it's an it's an amazing process. I, I like being part of the exploration process. I know as scientists, uh, you guys enjoy it too, but it can also be a little bit like, I want more answers. I need more data of this type or right? this type. You guys, well, are very you guys are very flexible, but I can imagine that's There's never going to be enough data to make <laughs> us happy. So we try, we try to find the most advantageous place to, you know, we, we, we try to find that compromise of yeah. uh, you know, how, how do you uh, get the, you know, the most bang for your buck? I hate to say that, but um, yeah, we, we try to efficient uh, efficiently sample in, in order to minimize the impact to uh, what we're exploring That's and right. uh, uh, make the most uh, out of the science that we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's interesting you say that because we also do have almost an overabundance of data. It's so in there's some ways, data yes. from so many sources these days that are just accruing in these you know worldwide databases and from satellites, from um, buoys, well, it, you know, and it's it's hard to use them. Sometimes the resolution is you know um, sometimes the like scale of information is too large, um, and also the amount of data you have. So it's really it's kind of difficult to find those pinpoints of sort like those pinpoints of information that are representative of, of your specific location. Uh, yeah, and in, in my field, um, y you physically have to have the samples in right, order to get yeah. those data. So um, we have we have a problem with uh, we 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 have a problem with um, some areas being very oversampled, and that helps us understand those very well. But they're still, as you say, they're they're the snapshot in space and time. And we're missing a lot of points that uh, related to that time series uh, further back in time, where samples are harder to get to mm -hmm. and harder to work with in the lab because you know we have to deal with the, you know, the effects of time, uh, alteration, right. changes to these things, uh, uh, doing age corrections to the radiogenic ingrowth of the samples, which always you know propagates a little error into the number that you're getting, and uh, they're just places that you know like like the Southern Ocean that are uh, a little bit inaccessible to deep sea work because uh, uh, the weather window is right. um, almost non-existent a lot of the time there. So makes it so yeah. clear why the... So there are huge gaps that I have to deal with. And it's like, so that's where some of the most interesting stuff, d at least to me, is is happening. I mean, I think it, it, it just like makes the point that what Nautilus, what Ocean Exploration Trust is doing and what now I think more in the earth and ocean science community are doing and hopefully in other fields as well, but um, starting to share data, starting mm -hmm. to make data open, for, available for researchers, make it accessible to people doing work across many different communities so that they can start compiling and adding to the data, um, digging into the data in ways that are um, suit their unique questions. And I think that's so important. It's not true, it's not always the case that uh, every time a research project goes out uh, to collect data that they openly share that data. It's right. not, um, yeah. the Nautilus makes it seem like that's everyday practice because it is uh, mm -hmm. for Ocean Exploration Trust, but it's really not yet around the world. But I think that's gonna shift the whole science and exploration and research paradigm as we start to realize how much more we can learn when we start sharing, we yeah. start cooperating, we start uh, um, giving each other access to to knowledge that we're that we're out able to gain. Yeah, and I'm, yeah. I'm a big proponent of uh, you know publicly funded science being publicly available, and that means uh, not having a paywall on published research too, mm -hmm. um, which is a huge problem. Like Hail. right now, I, yeah. Case in point, uh, I, I'm on this review article that uh, I'm one of the co-authors on it, and uh, that just uh, was was uh, uh, published. Uh, in late August, and it had a couple weeks of free access, but now it's behind a paywall. Wow. And it's a journal uh, that's pretty high profile, but uh, not actually accessible by um, a lot of uh, university library subscriptions, including oh, wow. mine. Wow. And I've had a few people ask Can't me for a copy article? of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I have a copy on my work computer, uh, wow. but I'm 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 thousands of miles from my work computer, and I can't log into it right now. Uh, yeah. And. <laughs> Uh, that means that I can't send people my own review paper <laughs> that I co-authored because I cannot access it with uh, any of my active university credentials. Wow. And uh, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. But also on the, on the side of data availability, there's that other factor of, um, you know, I'm, I'm sitting on some data that I'm trying to publish and 
I can't share that because if I share those numbers somewhere, somebody could scoop that and beat me to publication because I'm, I'm admittedly not the fastest to get to publication because it takes me a little time to write. I struggle a little bit with writing and uh, uh, I really like trying to dig into the nuance of the data set too. And that's that's something that takes time, you know, yeah. sitting with that data and really getting to understand it and kind of kind of feel it, you well, know? We've incentivized it has, our, it, it our has its own kind of shape to it, you know? and. Of course, you should be given as much time as you need. Yeah, and, uh, but so we've incentivized an entire uh, system around uh, kind of capitalist frameworks and goals that say, mm -hmm. you know, you, there's limited, there's scarce resources, that this data yeah. is, is scarce and that uh, you have to keep prevent other people from taking it. Um, yeah, otherwise so it's going to disappear. Keep it, yeah, I have to keep it proprietary until, uh, yeah. until it's ready to be published. And then, yeah. and then yeah, I, uh, once, once it goes off to the journal for review, yeah going up as a preprint. Preprints are publicly accessible. Yeah. Um, if people want a copy of that paper and they email me asking for it or some of the supplement or whatever, yeah, they're going to get it. No There's questions al asked. That's the, the way, because that's the way it should be. Yeah. Also the Ew. problem that not enough people are wanting to read papers. <laughs> True. <laughs> Stuff and, too. Um, yeah, it, well, you know, most of us in academia are uh, you know, we're, we're thrilled if you reach out to us and ask for a copy of our paper because it means somebody's <laughs> reading it. And we're yeah. and mo the vast majority of us are happy to share that if you want to get a copy. Assuming we can get to our own research. <laughs> if it's behind a paywall, it makes it a lot harder. And, you know, if, if anybody's asked me for the copy of that recently, because there's been at least three of you, um, I, I apologize, I haven't been able to get it, but as soon as I can get my hands on a copy, I will. Um, and there, there are other ways to do this that are in a little bit of a legal gray area, but they're they're trying to support that mission of uh, more publicly accessible knowledge too. And uh, um, in my official capacity, I, I can neither endorse nor uh, condone it, but um, <laughs> do as you will. <laughs> so, sorry, I might have missed this, but so how, when does it get out of, what, what, what did you call it, paywall? Um, it, it will never get out of paywall. It, it had two weeks free access and uh, then that went away. Oh, and yeah, that's it's very common for, uh, uh, most journal articles are actually behind a paywall, but we can get around it with our university credentials mm -hmm. um, for a number of journals. Uh, this one, for some reason, is not included in, in uh, the normal array of uh, uh, journals that libraries usually have access to. So I've tried to get it, uh, to get to it from uh, Maryland. I've tried to get to it from my old Hawaii credentials. Wow. One of my friends tried to get to it through uh, her, her uh, large university's credentials and couldn't. And we're just like, crap. <laughs> we have to, we have to pay for reliable journalism. We, I mean, for, forget I reliable know, science. It. We have to. Uh, there's paywalls on everything now. What's sure the paper? is. What's the title? Uh, Nature reviews Earth and Environment. Oh, um, I'm out of your paper. Oh, uh, cool, cool, cool. <laughs> Shall I, is it? Do you think it's on your uh, Google Scholar? Uh, Shall I just moment, Google though. you? Um, should be. Uh, yeah. Um, hang on. Call up Google. Oh, Scholar. you're actually the first person to come up on Google. Um, it's not on my it's not my University of Maryland thing, but on my Google Scholar profile, yeah. it should. Uh, Let's see. Mahino, while we look up Val's paper, is there, uh, were you going to share something with us? Or are you, <laughs> are you just studying over there? <laughs> I, I would, if it's a good time for some poetry, blue water poetry. Oh. And don't a, don't ask me. It's always a good time for that okay. if you ask me. Oh, is it available through USGS? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> Oops. We we do. One of the co-authors is on USGS, and that has a uh, an open access mandate to it. So maybe it's up on the USGS uh, database. Sorry, Mahina. No, 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 no. This is your work, and it's important. And it <laughs> should. We should have access to it. We should all. Uh, yeah, I, I'm. Mm -hmm. I'm trying. I mean, as as soon as I can, I'm gonna have a uh, publicly publicly yeah. accessible version uh, somewhere on the internet for folks. That's it, yeah. I clicked. We'll see how long it takes. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. sorry. It's it's loading. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Publications Records. Warehouse. 
Oh, that'll take you to the web page, yeah, I think. Yeah, I don't think that'll... Um, I'll, bet, I'll bet the warehouse will get that. You know, I think Megan actually has a copy. I could probably just go ask her. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta ask the expedition chief. <laughs> Can I have a copy of my paper? Please? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it, the isn't world, that absurd? The world we live in. I think, yeah. we, I think we do need some poetry to rescue us from this <laughs> This is why publicly funded <laughs> research hey, should be publicly it. accessible. Wait, hey. wait but hey. I don't know if it's down... Um, I think this is going to take me to the same thing. pubs.usgs.gov. That might actually be it. Yeah, but I, it says I've already clicked on it. I think it's going to take me back to... Oh, oh, it's doing the thing where it takes you around in circles. Yeah. How to I get around the paywall, everybody. Uh, yeah. how, to, how to dance, the, the Google dance, to try to get around they're, the paywall. We'll You're welcome. The this area. is uh, today's mm -hmm. lesson, Blue Water lesson. Today's lesson in the... Uh, uh, Wait, click on, click on, no, click, 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 no, try clicking on that, no, what do I, go, ba go back, <laughs> click on, click on that. Sometimes, oh. that is, sometimes that is out finding papers, Wait, it just you guys. open access version. Oh, that may not be the final nope, format. It's not the access. It's, <sighs> no. What? They're, sometimes it's got they the data availability, though. This is why people go mm. to the dark web. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> there are places not on the can, dark web that you I can go to I bet we can find Val's paper on the dark web. <laughs> I, I've been waiting for it to show up in a different repository, and it will eventually. <laughs> I know, it just, I was, that's it just what takes I was a while. It might. Yeah, no, it's not quite up there yet. I was just checking Discord the Discord followers, do your duty. Go find it on the dark web. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you can get to your figures. <laughs> it's not nothing. Yeah. I mean, the figures are, I mean, that tells the story, right? Uh, I made a couple of those. Nice. They're really <laughs> nice looking figures. <laughs> <laughs> I will pass that along oh, to my co authors. Look at Thank those you. Figures. No, for real. <laughs> yeah, so I made that this one. one. Oh, and then click on it, I, didn't, I, didn't make the, I didn't make the second panel. And then. Keep going. That's almost worse. They're like, ooh, look, you can get a glimpse. Yeah. You, you can see the <laughs> figure, but we're not going to give you the details. And that's that's a, uh, a remake of an old Just figure. Just a tease. Uh, I'm not sure which of us redid tease. that, because multiple of us have redone that. And then, uh, yeah, I helped with that one a little bit, but didn't nice. do most of it. All right. Yeah. Yes, I helped. <laughs> I need some poetry, y'all. Now I, yeah, now I desperately it. need some poetry after trying to get around, get around paywalls. Paywall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Nope, doesn't have it yet. Ooh. Uh, this one is The Wormhole Room of Pole by Sage Uilani Takahiro, and it's the Kumulipo remix. Ooh. Yeah. So this one is, it's kind of about uh, the counter hidden meanings and connections to the Kumulipo in a contemporary uh, manner by Uilani Takahiro. Born is everything from the dark and the slime, where another world swirls words to life with a tongue. L lungs suck the breath of an ocean. Mana carved in the na'o, now born from a petroglyph, poem is her kino. She hears the song of the i'ivi singing to the o'o, who are off somewhere breeding. In a forest where the pig digs into the earth, birth is the uprooted tracks of Kamapua'a, pimping Napua and making Mo'o women wet in the night. Born are the Kamali'i o Keia Mo'olelo. Here we are, the children of Hawaii, Eyamako Namele Ho'okani. Here we are, the leaders of tomorrow. Olie Olie no Mako. Born are the passions from the kupuna. Born are the dances to the people. Born are the stories from the keiki. Born is the blood of Kanaka and the spirit of the kumulipo through the wormhole womb of Po. Born are the prisons of our world and the oli we conceive them in. They cage a voice singing poems to the o'o birds who are off somewhere breeding. Mm. Mahalo, um, Mahina. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Traveling. those always transport us somewhere else. Of course. We've, we've been kind of talking about the per the portal of Po and yeah. just coming mm -hmm. into the space and seeing what we have seen up until this point. And I found this in my book the other day and it was like so relevant. I mean, resonates within each of our Pu'u'vai, our hearts. 
It does, yeah. And I think we might have you and your poetry to blame for some of our dreams. Mahina. <laughs> <laughs> Taking us through these portals, these wormhole portals into into and out of Po and but hey, what a gift. Yes. What a gift to be uh, dreaming with all of you. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah, early. It's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These Nautilus dreams. Nautilus dreams. Mm -hmm. Dreams are more vivid at sea, I feel. Absolutely. They are. Mm -hmm. they are. I've, I've, uh, I've said that for a while. I've had mm -hmm. that. Um, and they stick with you. Yeah. Stick with you. Speaking of dreams and things being birthed and awesome colleagues, uh, Ocean Exploration Trust Kelly uh, sending us a message saying, we're doing a great job. She appreciates all of our hard work this expedition. She is soon to be a mom, already a mother, caring. Oh, hey. And Kelly, uh, we appreciate you so much. I don't know if everyone on board knows, they probably do not, but behind the scenes, of course, there's an amazing OET team and all the things you see the, the science communication fellows doing and all the ship to shores and all mm -hmm. of that, that's all being organized wow. and set up by Kelly. And mm -hmm. uh, so managing teachers and, and parents wow. and classrooms and work groups from all over the world and bringing them uh, to us on board Nautilus, so uh, making that happen so seamlessly, and uh, it's a it's an honor to to work as as part of part of Kelly's team and and be a colleague. So thank you for that encouragement, yeah, Kelly. Thank and, you, uh, Mahalo, yeah. Kelly, it's and thank you for all you. the coordination you do, all of your Hana, your work. It's admired by all of us and appreciated by all of us. Absolutely. We show up to a Google Calendar page filled with all of our ship to shores, and we sometimes oh go, gosh. Kelly, what are you doing to us? But no, just kidding. We love it. We love all those sessions, and it's okay. such a gift. We're changing lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got to participate in a really amazing ship to shore yesterday that had like 1,200 students. Whoa! Yeah, they. I, we didn't realize we couldn't see them all, but it it had been coordinated by. Um, you know, so someone was, I think, coordinating like homeschool children. Wow! And oh so gosh. it was like a whole bunch of different children coming in on different, like, wow. you know, it was it was really amazing. Um, middle schoolers too, you know, wow. just it was. Oh, yeah. supercharged science! Is I think that, that was one? it. Yeah. Yeah, that they're a great partner of Ocean Exploration Trust, and that's awesome. You did that. I'm glad you were on that one, Virginia. It was really fun, and and you know, you couldn't see the faces of all the students because only a portion were on the Zoom call, but. You know, a lot of them seemed really interested and invested and interacting. It was, um, you know, it's so amazing to see that. And, it, you know, what a wonderful reminder of the reasons we're out here and what we're doing and, and um, you know, how it can change people's, you know, perspectives. Absolutely. You know, I've, I've mentioned this before on, uh, on watches, but, uh, yeah, when, uh, I was a kid in the 90s. Um, when the Jason project was a thing, and uh, our school had uh, some videos uh, documenting, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jason project and like what it was all about and what they were finding, and I remember what, watching. What those is the Jason project? Yeah, it's an important to the legacy of OET, but I bet yeah. most people don't uh, don't know about Jason. Um, I don't know the details about it because it was a long time ago, and I was uh, pretty young when I heard about it. But um, so it, it was a project that. Uh, our own uh, Dr. Ballard uh, was running back in the 80s, 90s. Uh, I That's think right. Mike can speak more to this because he was actually uh, one of the participants in awesome. the Jason project. That's awesome. Uh, but yeah, it was a program that would take kids out to sea and uh, do science, just like we're doing. And uh, I saw some videos that uh, detailed some of that. You know, they showed him in class, and I thought that was the coolest thing. And I really wanted to do it, but I was, uh, I, I believe I was too young to be eligible at the time and also just kind of decided, you know, I'm just some kid from Michigan. I'm never going to be able to go out and do this kind of stuff. Wow. And then, you know, kind of went into the back of my mind and I forgot about it for a long time. And then, uh, you know, I sort of uh, stumbled my way into geology a good chunk of the way through my undergraduate uh, degree and ended up... Um, 
getting really interested in geochemistry and uh, uh, kind of how the mantle worked and plate tectonics. And I ended up getting in with the right PhD advisor who happened to go out to sea on occasion. And uh, he got a project funded while I was uh, in my first couple of years uh, that ended up becoming uh, the backbone of my PhD dissertation that involved going out to sea. And that just kind of gave me the bug. And, you know, and then he's like, yeah, this involves uh, research, a research cruise uh, that'll take us out to this part of the ocean. And uh, you'll, you'll get to do this work. And we'll get samples. And uh, yeah, I was like, and, and just kind of all those memories about seeing these Jason Project videos and thinking that was the coolest thing just all flooded back. And I'm like, huh. I actually get to do some of this stuff, <laughs> and I've I've uh, had you know these these opportunities that have come afterward, and uh, yeah, now I'm on uh, Dr. Ballard's ship. Look at you, this, and I mean, it's it, like holy cow, this is amazing. I mean, we do almost have to pause, and you know, we sit in here now, and it feels like you know we just we land in Honolulu, we get on board the ship, the, the ship's already here, but um, this has really been 40 years, maybe longer. But I think if uh, if you go back to to, um, to Bob's earliest visions of what how he could bring the ocean to life and especially the deep ocean to life and ocean science to life for more and more people, more and more young people, it goes back to the 80s. Mm -hmm. And uh, incredible that there's this legacy of you seeing it grow and grow and the technology advance and advance and finally catch up to that vision. And we're kind of sitting, as I think Mahina put it yesterday and uh, is, uh, reminds me of think of Kukui as well we are the we are the dreams of our ancestors and it's just mm -hmm. a really amazing to see how dreams come to life mm -hmm. so all of our wild dreams that we're having here at sea hopefully not all of them but many of them <laughs> will uh, uh, are, are busy coming to life and it's uh, it's awesome to watch that in in all of us uh, mm -hmm. I'm like one of the yeah, Robert's not in the room so I'm the elder in the house <laughs> and, uh, and uh, it's uh, it's awesome to watch all of all of you young, inspiring folks just uh, living out the dreams of your ancestors and just inspiring the heck out of me and I know so many other people. So it's uh, it's really incredible. Yeah, Incre no. I love that story, Val. You're just yeah, drawing really that good. line all the way through to right here, right now, mm -hmm. out here in Papahanaumokuakeo, where yeah. you're such an accomplished and <laughs> brilliant yes. geologist and scientist and human being so i, I don't know how it happens <laughs> like, it's it's this this wild combination combination of finding something that i wanted to do for the rest of my life and being privileged enough to be able to you know study it get good at it and getting in with you know the the, uh, the community of folks who get out to this space and uh you know all of them uh accepting me as a part of that community too that's awesome you know? um, and we we do need we, we're always in need of more marine scientists so don't think that this is uh something that you can't do because uh as far as i'm concerned there's uh there's space yeah absolutely for and the, across the whole team right mm -hmm. amazing to hear amber's story or journey with with nautilus and such yeah. an incredible talent learning watching catalina and all that she's doing and and serving now as our mapper and navigator, but with just an incredibly deep and expansive love for the ocean and, and for so much of life. And Kukui, Virginia, Mahina, mm -hmm. Zach, all different places in our own journeys and all so inspiring. So it's mm -hmm. pretty cool living this dream together with you guys. Lucky, lucky elder, <laughs> Uncle, Uncle Dan, he's happy. <laughs> Kids are doing it. We are doing it. It gives me a lot of hope. Now the internet wants to know what is your favorite sea creature? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I do love polar bears. They are marine mammals. They are. They marine are. Marine mammals, 100%. Polar bears are pretty cool. Oh, yeah. polar bears. They, those actually have been some of my, probably my favorite animals for a very long time. Let's go to the Arctic. Let's mm. do it, yeah. It's still warm enough. Catalina, is the jet pump working yet? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who, who, who's in the bridge? Can we just can we talk them into it? We're good. Flavio Zach has root beer. Nice <laughs> yeah, if it's Flavio, probably. <laughs> yeah, Flavio. <laughs> there we go. 
I wonder if they ever listened to SBR. Like, what the heck? Is going on? <laughs> I know Ariel was last year when all of us, he, he's he's twelve to four, and I was on twelve to four last year, and uh, yeah, he 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 admitted that uh, he would have us on at the bridge and just laugh along with us. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. You know, those watches can get pretty, you know, you're up there in the wheelhouse pretty much by yourself, maybe with an AV or something, and just, it's, it's just dark. Probably yeah. helps keep company. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we tried to get them to, to like, jump in and, uh, you know, can, uh, add to the conversation, but uh, uh, yeah. I, I think he was happy to just listen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm envious. I just mm -hmm. want to sit back and listen. Sometimes I do. <laughs> Usually I'm talking too much. Yeah. No, we you're all are. Great. You're you're doing a fantastic job of facilitating conversations. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Yeah, connections, Pilina. I don't see you as a kupuna. I joke, but you know, <laughs> in in a way, I see you with the heart of of a 17-year-old, as I do with myself. You know, in the same on the same you know the other side of the coin, I see us as like 70-year-old kupuna too, which Wait. is like a great. Like, I, I love that about you, Dan. Like, you see the world in such a unique way. You've had all of these experiences of, like, a kupuna, <laughs> traveling the world and sailing in different places, meeting different people, friends around the globe. Like, it's truly an amazing and inspiring life mm. that you've lived. And even as an educator, to put yourself into these different communities and to learn their ways of leadership, advocacy, teaching, their indigenous methods, or their you know practices that they use locally to inspire and educate and facilitate learning and growth. Oh, and you've done all of that mm -hmm. in just your 17 years. <laughs> <laughs> the experience of an elder, the <laughs> maturity of a teenager. Yeah, no. I love it. I love it. It's a good combo. It's I mean, a good combo. I, I don't it's mean to crude. joke, Maria. That compliment means very, very much yeah. to me. It's a <laughs> Wow. That's wow. beautiful. Oh, this is this is nice. Wow. Robert's uh, letting us uh, play with the little uh, 3D printed blue ball. That's and, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty pretty impressive. That is uh, I can see that doing just fine in the deep sea for sure. Are we printing these with two nozzles? Cuz that's cool. I don't know. And two two filament colors there. In Nautilus the, colors, the blue and yellow. Yeah. Ah, oh, yeah. Yeah, having having two extruders is one way to do that. But I've never actually played with that. Oh, I can't. Uh, I can't let this question drift too far down the feed. Uh, we have uh, we have a viewer chiming in from from uh, somewhere out there in the world. Don't know where, but uh, they have several ocean critter tattoos, Ooh, including nice. including a chonicops, an oh. octopus, a squid and crinoids. I'd like wow. to see the crinoid wow. tattoo, but wants to know, and I've, I've heard that tattoos are contagious and they, uh, they also- oh, they're addictive. They're <laughs> addictive. So, but they, they're asking what next? Ooh, what that's next? a good question. Oh. Anybody want to give a recommendation? You might be uh, putting art on somebody's body with this so recommendation. I do have this one concept drawing that someone gave me for a tattoo idea for my back. And I don't know if you can see it, Dan, you want to pass it to him, Amber? Oh, whoa. This is beautiful. Oh, so yeah. So, you know, you're going to... Oh, a, wow. It's Isn't a that deep, cool? It's a deep sea. It's sort of like the dive that we had on Sea Mount 11, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and it looks and like there, that. there's another one. I think you swipe to the right, and it should be right there. And it's, it's a, I think it's a shallow oh, wow. reef one. That's All right, so basically just uh, just find Zach, yeah. reach out, hire him as your tattoo <laughs> consultant, organisms. and he'll uh, <laughs> he'll share that incredible image that we're passing around the control van of so many beautiful, <laughs> all in color, Tuna deep sea, porch. deep sea organisms. Nice. But uh, yeah, I think there's, I think maybe a coral. Could I yeah. mean, there's not maybe a coral. Maybe yeah. a coral, like a. <laughs> Uh, I have it in here too. An ET well. sponge. Like, like, uh, an like a bubble gum bath? Yeah, there you go. The whole back. The whole back. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, polycute worm well, is a good idea. The, oh, that those would are be the good. hydrothermal. Um, Some worms. Yeah. A, yeah. yeah uh, polycutes are pretty yeah. cool. Uh, uh, tube anemones. Lantern shark. Um, what else? Shark. The black in the middle. Oh. Um, I had something in mind and I forgot it. Uh, really cool. Where would you, if you got a polychaete worm, where would you put it? 
It's a good question. Oh, you should do a Tomopteris. Those things are so beautiful. <laughs> if you're going to get a worm, get a Tomopteris worm. Tomopteris. Me, I'm going to Google it for those. Tomop. Maybe a nudibrank? Ooh. Ooh, a nudie. A nudie oh, beauty. beauty. You can get some really spectacular nudibranchs uh, in, the, in the sea. I know. Um, I'm always a fan of uh, volcanoes. The volcanoes, yeah, I, absolutely. I do have a volcano tattoo. Val's favorite ocean critter. Yes. The volcano. Yeah. Really no, cool. I love it. Yeah, I also, I also your like tattoos tumbling, awesome. tumbling snails. <laughs> yeah, and tumbling snails. That'd be funny. If, to, how would you get a tumbling snail? Pretty soon we'll have animated it, tattoos, uh, like a Maui in Moana. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Very <laughs> soon. Yeah. You can get it rolling down your back oh. or rolling down your leg. <laughs> cool. Catalina, I could see Catalina getting an animated tattoo like Maui, where it's just like a cool sea creature, but it's just yeah. like swimming around, moving around. That's coming out. I heard it's coming out in 2024. What is its tail doing? Hello, it's bioluminescent. What the? Hello. Oh, there's some pretty cool deep sea jellies too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, some of those predatory uh, medusas. Uh, oh. Yeah. Mm. Might be painful tattoo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Be, some of those shrimp that just swim around in the water column. Yeah. I'd get a smiley face. That's what I'd get. <laughs> Who here That's actually it. has some tattoos? Okay. Oh. Oh. <laughs> okay, yeah, get a squat lobster. Get a squat lobster. What is your tattoo on your arm, Amber? Uh, it's colored. Salvador colors. Dali. Piece. Oh, wow. Wait, what beautiful. is it? Uh, Salvador mm -hmm. Dali. Um, oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. Beautiful. You should come visit. the ocean on my feet. Really? Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Dali, yeah, what a mind, huh? We have a Dali yeah. Museum in St. Pete. You should come. Been, oh, you've been? Oh, that is yeah. a great museum. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Salvador, what a mind. Talk about living in a dream, huh? Or living under the influence, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> One of the, uh, both, on maybe. The bit of both. Yeah. <laughs> Fishy. Oh, yeah, Dali. Oh, thank you. It's uh, Lisa from the Netherlands. That's, uh, that's our tattoo friend. And uh, I'm glad you love these ideas. You've sparked a whole amazing debate from, on viewers online over what would, be, uh, what would be the best option. And here in the control van, we just love that you're putting ocean art uh, to carry with you everywhere you go. That's fantastic. Yeah, you're quite welcome. Oh, glad, I mean, they glad can we can suggest some Nautilus. things. Oh, yeah, that would be good. Yeah. Yeah, not the ship, the Nautilus, the animal, the Nautilus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're, they're pretty cool. They are very, very cool. Very cool. And there's some old ones. Um, there's some fossil, mm. like, um, um, dang Ammonites. it, the word that's in my brain is aragonite, and I don't Ammonite. think about it. Ammonite, yeah, there's some really, thank you, <laughs> thanks, Catalina. There's some really cool uh, morphologies um, of, of nautilus-like organisms, like there the really are. as well. Yeah, some of them have uh, those, those coiled shells, some of them mm -hmm. do not, and yeah, all sorts of different body plants for those. Right. They're pretty spectacular. Yeah, no, they're stunning. Absolutely stunning. Robert, you got any tattoos? You hiding any tattoos from us? <laughs> I don't think he's on SPL. <laughs> oh, you're not. He SPL. doesn't have to be. <laughs> he doesn't want to give his way a secret. When I was in the Coast Guard, that was all the rage. And back then, it was Looney Tunes character. Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy that I avoided. <laughs> not not oh, a bad decision there. Man. I could see you with like a roadrunner. Like Tweety oh, bird. Road runner. Oh, a Tweety bird, yeah. Oh, wow. It's Looney Tunes, huh? Oh, we have a friend coming on board in November and bringing along my full sleeve tattoo. This is we're going to be one of our fellow uh, Exploration Corps members with a Mars rover. Yeah, pretty All right. cool. Full sleeve tattoo with a Mars rover. Did you know that the Mars rover has a pet rock right now? Oh, pet really? rock yeah, on the yeah, rover. What? They were talking about it. They have a, it, somehow a rock ended up in its uh, wheel hub 
So that rock's been with it for the past, I think, couple of weeks now. <laughs> oh, awesome. Going along for a ride. It's like our little sea cucumber. Oh, Lisa in, uh, in the Netherlands trying to look up maybe polychaete worm. Polychaete, P-O-L-Y, is it C-H-E-T? K E T. Uh, hang on, just a sec. How do you spell uh, polychaete? What about a vampire squid? Ooh, that'd be so cool. polychaete, and I'm going to type it out because that's how I think. Yeah, that one is easier to type out and spell. P O L Y C H A E T E. A E T E. Polychaete. Named, um, I believe, after the. This He's down there. He's ready. He's watching. He's got water going um, on the wire. Yeah. He's all over it. <laughs> Named after the stiff bristles made of chitin oh. um, that are a part of uh, these types of worms. Keto. Awesome. And Mayo would make a great tattoo. And they have many of them, so poly, Keto. He tends to hang out at the winch control. Some more questions. We have uh, viewers wondering uh, how often we're all out at sea. Um, some of us are out to sea, uh, you know, only once in our lives. Uh, many people are not out at sea all that often that are on board. Um, but uh, seems like at least an annual thing. Val, are you out at sea for like a month out of the year every year or not that often? Nope. Um, uh, it's it's, it's kind of spotty. Um, my first yeah, time okay. out was uh, 35 days in uh, 2013. And then after that, I uh, went out to sea twice in... Uh, 2017, uh, both times on the Falcor. Uh, the first one was for about two and a half weeks, I want to say. Second one was uh, a two-leg thing, so uh, 10 days for the first leg. Uh, maybe that was the first one, I don't remember. It's been long enough. Uh, 10 days for the first leg, and then a few days in port, and then uh, it was like another two and a half weeks for the second leg. Um, then uh, 2018, a little uh, two-day jobby, uh, just off of west of Oahu. Um, and then... Uh, not again until last year and then this year. Mm -hmm. So it it's it's not very regular. Comes in waves. Pretty much if, if there's some science that is, you know, if there's if there's something relevant or something that I can uh, assist with and I'm available, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come out. But, uh, you know, um, there are other geologists in the sea, so uh, <laughs> uh, they don't they don't always need me. So. And that, uh, you know, that doesn't quite even compare. Probably none of us can quite compare to uh, our ROV engineers and pilots and some of our mappers and uh, spending uh, months of the year out at sea. Robert, how many months this year will you spend at sea? About how many? Um, so I think I averaged five or six expeditions a year. Yeah. Since wow. 1996. Wow. Wow. About half the year, huh? Yeah. I, yeah, I started out doing seven months. Seven have months you have you ever counted your sea days? No. no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's years out at sea. He's I, good at math, but that's a lot of counting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my I time adds up as months. No. Yeah, yeah. Some people rack up literal years at sea. Some mm -hmm. of us uh, are still at months or weeks. Yeah. That's true. If you are interested in, uh, you know, any of the positions, it's a good question to ask uh, about that position. Uh, life at sea is really not for everyone at, uh, at, at those long durations. Robert is a very special human being who's an uh, Aquaman. Just <laughs> well, seven months is an here. exceptionally long <laughs> amount of time. That's insane. So but one that's month, I think, is bad. significant other at sea. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's not uncommon. Quite a few. Makes sense. Makes yep, sense. I, I have some colleagues who uh, met their SOs at sea. Uh, I think they're. I think I'm even aware of at least one wedding at sea. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. So. A wedding? Yeah. I don't know what? anything about it though. I've just like heard. <laughs> Actually, uh, I was on board Nautilus last year with uh, with, with a, a wonderful Hawaiian woman, uh, Elizabeth Lindsay. I don't know Elizabeth if you're listening, but uh, uh, she lives in Florida now and and got married underwater. Wow. Oh, wow. That's cool. That was beautiful. That awesome. Yeah, it was amazing yeah, images. That's fantastic. Wow. Under yeah. the Two of our ROV pilots are married. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Sing it, Kukui. Sing it, Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
wild. Yeah. Oh, we are definitely getting closer to uh, to being back on deck with oh, Hercules yeah. and Atalanta. We're, we're less than 500 meters. Yeah, we depth. are uh, cruising up through the water column. Yeah. I spent many a holiday at sea. Oh, I bet. Yeah. I bet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ROV pilots uh, tend to spend, you know, quite a few days. Maybe not all all as much as uh, Robert, but if that's, uh, you know, some of them working for for various institutions or various projects and uh, bouncing around, getting to drive different ROV systems or submersible or submarine systems. So it's a, it's a highly valued, sought after skill set, and uh, encourage people to explore it and to. Uh, find ways to fall in love with being at sea. And once again, I am wearing my coffee. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> this, is, this is a very common occurrence, even when oh uh, even when I'm not on a moving ship. <laughs> Sometimes I just get a little too excited about drinking coffee. <laughs> Can't relate, yes. For the record, it is not on the keyboard. The keyboard is way <laughs> far away. <laughs> it's just on me. <laughs> I think I'm going to go ahead and get Bridge to start streaming forward. Is this a good time? Another beautiful day. You can see it in that small corner. Yeah, it sure <laughs> is. Oh, and the deck is smiling again. Ooh. We, we've had a pretty smiley deck the whole dive, so I, I think uh, I think everybody's feeling pretty good about things. We're all getting a little tired, but we're in good spirits. Yeah. It was so cool yesterday to see the different birds that were. Um, yeah, because you know, while we're out here, we've been seeing a lot of the, the boobies, but, yes. um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and some shearwaters. But yesterday we saw a couple different, and it was just so fun. Um, you know, it, it's one of those key signals that you're you're somewhere a little bit different. You're closer to land. Something has changed when you can see some of the different birds around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually had a couple of flies uh, around the ship yesterday, too, which is kind of unusual when you're out at sea. So that's how I knew we were close to some sort of land mass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so close to Midway, actually. Yeah. 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 Just yeah. past right. Right, right. right. Past just, just southeast of it. Um, yeah. yeah, very cool. So, and, um, Apparently, they need, they need a trash pickup at the camp there at Midway. <laughs> there are flies. Yeah, there are flies everywhere. We used to dive on a site off of New Jersey that where they were taking all the sewage sludge from New York City and Ooh. dumping it mm. in the ocean. Ooh. Yeah, you know, it's one of those one of those reminders that we have actually been using these spaces for many years, some of them uh, to remove resources and some of them to dump our waste in. Um, it's, uh, yeah, so yeah. you know, over 100 miles out to sea and there's flies everywhere. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's unpleasant. Yeah. They don't do that anymore. It's good. So, so I think they still do research, you know, diving on that site to, to look at what's going on down there. Yeah, that'd be that would be really interesting because you know I'm sure that was several years of uh, yeah, many, many garbage. Years doing that. Probably very. Yeah, you're right. Very deep. Yeah, it wasn't garbage. It was, you know, solid sewage waste. Ooh. Uh, take yeah. barges out there and dump it. Blah. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I know that there's been other, you know, there's so many instances of, of garbage dumps and, um, you know, uh, toxic chemical waste, you know, yeah, being right just... Right off of where I live, mm. DDT. Right? Ooh, yeah, yeah, that was a new always... one. Yeah. That was something that they found recently, too, had that a, um, a serious impacts as, yeah. as well, you know. You know, growing up and uh, being, being up on Lake Superior a lot, um, I had no concept that bald eagles were, uh, you know, they were supposed to be part of, um, you know, part part of the uh, 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 biological uh, community there. And it was only like in the last 10, 15 years that we started seeing bald eagles like everywhere. Actually, I think within the last 20, uh, yeah, we started seeing them all over the place up there. And, uh, you know, they, they started nesting. Um, in uh, the wilderness in the area and like we we knew where a couple of eagles nests were and, um so yeah that's that's part of the uh part of now what uh, uh we, we try to protect because those are you know uh bald eagles nests are um illegal to disturb mm -hmm. so yeah they, right. they've, they've moved back in and they're all over the place up there now and it's it's uh, pretty cool to see that it's cool. Yeah, Those yeah, guys yeah. love trash, though, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You go to the you yeah. go to the dump in Alaska, and there's bald eagles yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. Bald yeah. eagles and, and uh, grizzly bears. And bears, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've had a couple of bears uh, uh, move into the area too. Little black bears. They're uh -huh. uh, they're very skittish. So as soon as they see you, they'll run. Wow. We're we're trying to keep it that way. Yeah. So you know. Garbage yeah, doesn't stay out yeah. or anything. They'll be moving in before long. They're basically raccoons. Well, that, black bears. that that is, uh, you know, that that is uh, uh, their their habitat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's where they belong. They're gonna think your back porch is their habitat pretty soon. <laughs> Maybe even. No, your that room. has happened before. Uh, <laughs> one one of the uh, neighboring cabins where uh, my great aunt and uncle lived for a long time. Um, yeah. and they had a. Uh, a bird feeder full of seed up on the porch. This was like 20, 25 years ago. Uh, we're just sitting down at dinner, and we'd been grilling on the back porch. And there's a breeze coming in from the lake, blowing stuff back into the swamp. And uh, uh, we get a call from them saying, "There's a bear on our porch," and uh, everybody stops, like drops what they're eating, and just like rushes over to the windows to go see. And by then, the bear had run off, and you know, everybody's like, off. "Where's the dog?" Because we had to keep the dog outside yeah. during dinner because. Yeah. Uh, very, very sweet pup, but a um, uh, pretty shameless beggar. And uh, <laughs> dinner was his, dinner was the favorite time of his. And uh, it's, it, it's just this whole thing. We never saw the bear again, Be but the bear, bear was going after, you know, we weren't, we weren't sure if the, if like uh, the smell of things cooking on the grill drew the bear in, but the bear went for uh, the bird seed. And yeah. that seems to be a pretty common thing that they go after. Oh. So, and uh, there've been a couple sightings in the years since. We, we think there's one that, may have uh, hung around for a couple of years, but I haven't heard anything recently. Just haven't been up there in a while yeah. uh, since COVID. Brown bears and grizzlies can be a little bit of a different thing, but the black bears are uh, almost always just overgrown raccoons. They're just curious, <laughs> want, want to get into your trash cans and, and, yeah. and uh, your coolers and your refrigerator, anything. They're just scavenging for food. Still powerful, yeah. amazing animals, but uh, yeah. Yeah, that's why we're, uh, you know, try, trying to uh, keep things up there so that they don't get used to being around uh, human habitations and, you know, relying on our trash as their food source. Yeah. You know, we don't want them uh, becoming less afraid of us. Yeah. Because that, that changes their behavior. Issues. Yeah. They had one come in the house. Wow. Whoa. Oh. Yeah, it came in after the dog food. Oh, <laughs> the dog food. Their little hands are so cute. Yes. Oh. I was rather shocked to go in the kitchen and see the raccoon. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> that would be alarming. <laughs> don't tell us what you said. Yeah, don't tell us. Not on SPL. Not on SPL. They're pretty bold, you know? They oh, yeah. They, oh, yeah. If they want to get in, they will. They just look at you like you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know? Really well. <laughs> sounds like a cat. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, be careful when I feed the cat, because otherwise I'm feeding the raccoons. Yeah. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I do have a neighbor who's feeding a very fat um, opossum instead of oh, the yeah. neighbor cats. Oh, right. dear. Oh, 
Yes, she thinks she's feeding some cats, and there are cats in the area, but um, they are far more skittish than the possum that comes out every night that oh, you can see. Oh, possums get nasty. <laughs> and it is getting larger and larger. Possums are good to eat, oh no, the possums yeah. are fantastic. Yeah. I'm a hundred percent about it. I just think I it's. But they can get mean. They like the get mean. Possums get are pretty. Stuff. Yeah, they're pretty <laughs> passive, though. I mean, I've, I've ran into a few of them, and I mean. Just I've never had a bad interaction with them. I can't just look at each other and just like, okay. Yeah, <laughs> they're help, like you said, they're helpful. They eat bugs. Yeah. And, like, and ticks. Yeah, yeah. ticks. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, so, which is very important in Florida. So I think I yeah. read somewhere that actually them eating ticks, it's very rare. It's not like a normal occurrence. They don't they don't go out of their way, to, but they if they if it's there, it's there. So like it's like I've I've heard people saying that oh that's you know that's what they target mostly you know, it's, it's like rare occurrences when they do and it's, it's like they're opportunistic. <laughs> Dropping our deep sea possum knowledge on you on here on SPL. <laughs> uh, that's what you get when you stay with us through blue water. Box of chocolates. To I know. I don't know why it's yeah. pretty now. <laughs> It was duty the other day. <laughs> yeah, the other problem with overfeeding an opossum is uh, it does eventually reach a uh, spherical state in which uh, <laughs> it becomes the ideal test subject for uh, simplified physics problems, oh, much like geez. the spherical cow. Um, I don't, I don't know if I, if I can support that. <laughs> you never heard of spherical cows? <laughs> I, I wish, I, I wish the internet could about. see Virginia's <laughs> the look on Virginia's face. <laughs> She's had enough of Val's <laughs> spherical cows. I like enough of spherical cows. Yeah. All, one one thing I know about opossums is that they have um, fat stores behind their eyes, and so um, when they start getting too eating too much food, their eyes they go blind. Start to you know Ooh, go out. Fill oh, no. oh no! Yeah. So oh. they start going cross-eyed, and so they can't see as much. It's kind of a, <laughs> a natural like you know, awesome. slimming down sort of oh. mechanism, you know. I but love, I suppose. I love me some cross-eyed yeah. possums it's nice yeah uh, i mean it has its Keep own wikipedia eating. page the spherical cow i it's, it's definitely don't know everything that's on wikipedia <laughs> i i'm i'm oh. a giant nerd so i know all this I, I i know way too much internet stuff um yeah the spherical cow is a humorous metaphor for the highly simplified scientific models of complex phenomena uh in originating in theoretical physics the metaphor refers to physicists tendency to reduce a problem to the simplest form imaginable oh. in order to make calculations more feasible you mean feasible. like life in a vacuum yeah 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 spherical yeah. cows in a vacuum yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. even if the simpli simplification hinders the model's application to reality. Yeah. And in that case, you know, uh, spherical cow is kind of short for spherical cow in a vacuum. And yeah, yeah. So. Like, yeah. So basically the way that I, I, th I always thought of that sort of thing is the fact that physics is always like, oh, yeah, well, if this happens in a vacuum, then we know about it. I'm like, yeah, but life, we, we can't live in a vacuum. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the spherical cow. Yes. Okay, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's a wonderful thing. Especially getting to teach people about it. <laughs> All right, my friends, we uh, yeah, do isotopes in a vacuum. We yep. are going to be approaching our time to uh, let operations bring the ROVs back up. We hope uh, we hope our oceanic white tip friends are still visiting. Maybe some uh, squid, plenty of jellies, I'm sure. Although it is middle of the day. And uh, we'll see. We'll see what we get to see. But it's it's been a real pleasure. Another watch with the greatest watch the world's ever known. Eight to twelve. Na one fifty four. Deep sea travelers. As this is always. Daniel Kinzer signing off. Yeah. Hello. Thanks all. Yeah. Thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, we should be back approximately midnight, plus or minus a couple hours as uh, the schedule evolved. So, yeah, uh, see hello, you then. Everybody. Yeah. For a bit. Mahalo, deep, everyone. So Ahui ho, malama Take care until we meet again.
So we can reduce speed again if you want. If you want to. Or leave it alone. Either way. all the peoples. <coughs> she, you should go by this, the wire out number. Uh, control van. I go ahead, control. We are at 50 meters if you're ready to take it over. Hey, yeah, stand by. I don't have a single person on deck yet, so I'm going to start looking. <laughs> Copy that. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. There's a shortage of minions. Well, because they're not coming on for a bit. Right? Is it 11 o'clock recovery? Okay, we're gonna hang out. Okay. <laughs> yep, that's fine. Except for the captain's on the bridge. <laughs> he might. Uh, yeah. Might be a while. <laughs> Look at all the fishes. Is Sharks and fishes. Is
if one of those fish ends up in the thruster, there's going to be a lot of excitement. <laughs> How many of them are there? Like that looks like at least three. Huh?
lot of noobs down there. Bridge, bridge, back deck. Are we clear to proceed with the recovery? Charlie, to proceed with recovery. Proceeding with the recovery, or Atalanta's coming up. Copy that. Snappy.
Control van. Herc seems to be creeping a little close to the stern. Can you run her back a little bit? Yeah. Run her back. Copy that.